you very much, everyone. It feels rather strange coming here instead of in chapel, but uh, it's nice to be here. And thank you for coming. Turning up for things is not a trivial matter. You've taken the trouble to come, and thank you for doing that. I know you have to be here, but uh, I'm assuming you've come because you want to be here. And I'm sure, and I hope, that the topic I've chosen or the wording of it will become clearer to you as we, as we go along. I probably haven't told you much about myself um, in my sort of early uh, adult years. Um, as you know, I grew up in South Africa. Um, I was a, I think I still am, a very sensitive person. Uh, even when I was a little boy, I felt things very deeply and, uh, and, and was aware of things um, happening around me and very <coughs> conscious of my parents and my brothers and sisters things that happened at school. Schooling uh, in South Africa at that time was very rough, rigid, uh, strict rules, corporal punishment, things like that. So it was quite a tough environment. And I felt things quite deeply. And then uh, when I finished school, I went into went to drama school to study drama, to be an actor. And then um, I was conscripted. Now in South Africa at that time, all white males were conscripted forced to go into the military, uh, military forces uh, to fight against the freedom fighters or terrorists as they were known who were trying to bring about liberation from apartheid. I'd grown up the son of a priest. My father uh, had a parish on the outskirts of an African township. You can imagine in South Africa in those days people had to live in separate areas, uh, go to separate schools, everything was separated. But I grew up uh, mixing with people uh, who were a different uh, race to me, uh, which is very rare, and I'm so grateful for that. But then came the time when the government, the uh, 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 nationalist apartheid government, forced us all to go and fight against our fellow South Africans. I didn't want to do that. The choice was jail, skip the country, uh, or go and do, uh, just do what you were told to do. But there was one other option. And that was to join the police, the South African police, and try to be involved more in crime prevention, uh, work in the drug squad and things like that. So I chose that option. It was double the time, so instead of two years, I had to do four years uh, of forced conscription. During that time, um, I saw some terrible things, and I won't go into details about them, but the point of me telling you this is that I think when I came out of those four years and went back to study to be a priest, I had been traumatized. I had probably a mild form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I started drinking too much. I started smoking cigarettes, uh, although that started while I was in the police, something I thought I would never do. And things started to unravel to a certain extent. And so up my life went on. Got married to a wonderful person, had four sons, uh, and, uh, as I say, became a priest and began to work first in parishes and then in schools where I've been for 26 years. But about six, seven years ago, my wife introduced me to the thing I'm going to introduce you to today. Perhaps she sensed that I was struggling. Perhaps she sensed that although I was functioning well in my job and in my work and, and everything, that actually deep down I was stressed, I was struggling with past memories, with things that I had to deal with. And so I come to you this afternoon to speak to you about how to rewire your brain, how to change the way your brain works. It particularly relates, of course, to mental health issues and to neuroscience. It's called the neuroscience of mindfulness. What is neuroscience? Well, it's simply the study of the nervous system, the brain, behavior, thinking. And neuroscience works closely with all these other disciplines that you see here. I'm not a scientist. I was never good at science, but I've taken these years, these past years, I've taken a great interest in this. Learned a lot, read a lot, and gone on many courses, as has Mr. Wood. Well, that's neuroscience, but what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is an English word, it's a translation of a Sanskrit word, and it really, the Sanskrit word really means to remember. 
but we've actually chosen the word mindfulness in the English language for a reason. Because remember for us means something in the past. To think about something that's happened in the past. But the sense of the word remember in Sanskrit is a bit like when you're in church and your mum uh, and you're sort of making a bit of a noise when you're little and your mother taps you on the shoulder and says, remember where you are. Remember where you are. It's not remember in the past. It's take note of where you are. Notice where you are. And then you say, oh, oh yes, I'm in church. I better quieten down. So mindfulness is the word remember, but in the sense of awareness. Taking note of what's happening around you. Trying to get away from living on autopilot all the time. And try to spend more time just noticing things that impinge on your five senses. What can I smell? What, can I, what, what am I seeing? Sometimes we're looking at something and we don't even notice it. I'm sure you've had that experience. I can drive my car from my house here down to Sainsbury's and park in the parking, uh, parking area there and then realize, think to myself, how did I get here? I don't remember driving down South Road. I do it so often. I don't remember traffic. I don't remember buses, pedestrians. How, that's dangerous. But I drive on autopilot sometimes. And I'm trying to do that less. That's what mindfulness does. It began uh, many thousands of years ago with Buddhist monks and then with Christian monks who went into caves and spent time alone, praying, meditating, trying to notice the presence of God or just the presence of, 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 of what was around them. And then in the 1970s in America, a man called John Kabat-Zinn, uh, who was a medically trained a, a scientist, um, had some friends who were doctors and uh, GPs, and they said to him one day that quite a high percentage of their patients were sent away because the doctors couldn't help them. And he said, what percentage do you think you can't help? And the doctors were coming up with figures like 20, 30, 40 percent of their patients. And he said, what do you do with them? And the doctors said, well, we just send them away because we can't, we can't help them. And he said, well, would you mind sending them to me? And I'll see what I can do. John Kabat-Zinn had developed this idea of mindfulness, which he'd picked up from Buddhist monks who'd come to live in America. And he'd studied what they do. He even started in those early days to measure their brains and how their brains were functioning. And he came up with this sort of definition as he practiced mindfulness and tried to help people. Uh, and this is it. Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. A lot of the troubles that we have in our lives spring from our thought world. The thoughts are not real. I always thought my thoughts were real. Actually, they're not. They're just little events in the brain that come and go like the clouds in the sky. But a lot of our problems come from our thought world. And our thought world takes us out of the present moment into some other dimension which can catastrophize things and whip them up into something really terrible when in fact it hasn't actually happened. Intention. Attention and attitude. Now a lot of research has been done since the 1970s and this mindfulness idea has become very fashionable, very popular today uh, across the world, particularly in the Western world. One of the interesting bits of research that was done by Professor Mark Williams at Oxford University is to do with attitude. He got groups of people together and he divided them into two, let's say a group of ten here and a group of ten there, in different rooms. The first group he gave a pencil and he said, I want you to hold the pencil in your mouth, in your teeth, like this. And then he showed them a short uh, film, a sort of a, co a, a comedy film. And the other group, he said, I want you to take the pencil, they were in a different, different room, watching the same film, of course. And he said, I want you to hold the pencil in your, in your lips like this. 
and watch the film. And both groups watched the film. Which group do you think rated the film the funniest? The group with the pencil in their mouth like this? Or like this? Any suggestions? The second one? No, it was the first group. This group. The reason was because holding their pencil in your teeth like that <coughs> gives you a slight smile. You're not aware that you're smiling, you don't even think you're smiling. But because your, 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 the attitude of your body is like this, you tend, they tended to enjoy the, the, the film more. And the people with the pencil like this had a kind of a sad face. They weren't even conscious of it, but in their brain, it affected the way they experienced that film. And I think this is so profound, and it's been proved scientifically, that our attitude to life, the way you stand, if you stand like this and wander around like this, you're going to feel miserable, or you, it, you're more likely to feel miserable. If you stand like this, and your head is high, even if you're feeling in the depths of despair, the attitude alone can help you in so many ways. What is mindfulness not? There are a lot, of, a lot of myths about mindfulness, and people say it's just meditation, positive thinking. <coughs> First of all, it's not positive thinking at all. It's not about thinking so much. It's about being in the moment and, and just being aware of the things impinging on your senses. And it's not about just relaxing. In <coughs> fact, if you practice the meditation, which I'll show you at the end, you have to be quite alert. Falling asleep is not an option. If you find yourself falling asleep in our training, we were taught, go and have a cold shower or something and come back and try again. Yes, sleeping is important, but you can't mix sleeping with meditation because it's a kind of, uh, it, it's an activity where you need to be alert and aware. More about that in a moment. And it's not going into a trance and it's certainly not trying to empty your mind because you've spent a lot of time filling your mind. With, with, with facts and with knowledge and so on, emptying your mind would be a travesty. It's about noticing what's happening in the mind and having control over it. So why are neuroscientists so interested in mindfulness? Well, some of the statistics, this is just recent, I think it was July last year, types of mental health problems among students just a bit older than you, a year older than you. Look at the statistics there for anxiety and depression. That is shocking. But these are people who've been polled in this YouGov poll. Why is it that we have this epidemic of anxiety and depression? Look at the things that are causing stress in teenagers. I don't know if this is true of you, but this is what they say. 23% schoolwork, and the other 23 parents even more than your dating and relationships or disputes with friends and so on. So stress and anxiety are very real for all of us, whether we're young or old. Well, there's a picture of the brain. I'm not an expert on this, but have a look at that. I'm not going to run through all of these things, but you can see clearly there which parts of the brain take care of which parts of our life and our living. Just give you a moment to look at that. Can you see? A little bit, little bit faint there. And you can see how the brain is divided up into these different areas, different lobes. Well, scientists and neuroscientists have discovered that our brains, which by the way make up 2% of our body weight, but actually use up 20% of our energy. So our brains are using energy a lot of the time. Calories as well are being burnt out. Just by thinking, you're burning calories. Isn't that amazing? Uh, but they discovered that our brains are not fixed. They used to think, until the 1970s, that when you get to adulthood, about your age, your brain is fixed, and that's it. You're stuck with your brain like that for the rest of your life. They now know that that is not true. It's called neural plasticity. The, the brain is plastic. It's, it's moldable. It's malleable. And you can exercise your brain like a muscle, just by repetition. Just like going to the gym and lifting a weight 
over and over again. You can change the structure of your brain, almost like changing the shape of your brain, although not quite like that. There are neurons in our brain, 80 billion neurons. They used to think it was 100 billion, but now how they've measured it, I don't know. But they say it's 80 billion neurons, and there they are, firing together all the time. They're doing it right now in your brain and in mine. But when neurons fire together repeatedly over and over again, they begin to wire together and they begin to form neural pathways. And we all have these pathways. These are the habits we've formed. These are the things we do over and over again which are useful to us and so we just keep repeating them. It's very useful, it's very important to have these pathways. But they've now discovered that you can actually develop new neural pathways right through life, right through to the end of your life, by repetition, because our brains work by repetition. So if you do something over and over again, it will develop a neural pathway in time. Four to six weeks, half an hour a day, and you've got a brand new neural pathway. You've begun to rewire your brain or remold your brain. Similarly, if you have a, a neural pathway that is destructive for you, a bad habit, might be smoking or swearing or whatever you don't want to do anymore, the reason why you do it all the time is, partly anyway, because of the neural pathway that's developed over months or years. You can undo you can allow a pathway to grass over in your, in your brain just by not doing the thing that you repeatedly did to develop the neural, neural path, pathway in the first place. And you've all seen a path in a field as you wander around in the summer uh, where animals have been walking or people have been walking. And then you see another path where they haven't walked for a while and you see how it begins to grass over. It works exactly like that in our brains. And so we do have some control, and this is what helped me when I was struggling six or eight years ago, in fact, it was just when I first came to King's. I was in my mid-40s, prime of life, feeling great, feeling healthy, lovely family, wonderful wife, all those things, but deep down inside of, my, of me, or in my brain, there was this nagging sense that I had been hurt, that I'd been traumatized uh, all those years ago. And I could have said, well, that's it. I'm stuck with it. Nothing to be done about it. Just live with your mental illness. Which is actually what it is. We all have a sense of mental ill health. Just like our bodies fall into ill health at times. Our brains and minds are just the same. This is how the brain evolved, I've discovered. We started off with the, the reptilian brain. And then it developed into the, the mammalian brain, and now the brain we have today. And I want to focus for a few minutes just on this part of the brain here. The limbic system and the neocortex. And that little red line pointing to what we call the amygdala. Scientists call the amygdala. This is something that really helped me when I learned this, because I began to realize how my brain actually works and how I can do something about it. So you see where the amygdala is. It's about here, quite deep down in our brains, but it's part, it's just sort of at the top end of the reptilian brain, our old brain, in evolutionary terms. And the amygdala is your fight and flight response center. It's the part of your brain that gets you going when something comes at you quickly and you need to escape or, or you need to fight. It's, it's a very important part of our brains. If we didn't have it, most of us would probably be dead by now. Because you'd be run over by a car, or something would happen, and you wouldn't be able to get away in time. It's a very important part of our brain, but it causes us a huge amount of pain. I'll tell you why in a moment. If you look at this slide, you'll see, again, the amygdala there, with the hippocampus, and the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. And I wanted to speak for a few moments about the limbic system, which is where our emotions are housed. Because this is crucial to uh, developing 
uh, a greater degree of, of mental health. When we perceive that we're in a threatening situation, that we feel unable to cope with, there's a, a, a sort of a cascade of things that happen, both in our emotional and in our hormonal system. Messages are carried along the nerves in the brain and from the cerebral cortex, and they, and they begin to regulate things that happen in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is really important in regulating things in our brain. It controls the autonomic nervous system. Now this is important, just bear with me for a moment, because the autonomic nervous system controls all the automatic functions of our bodies. Things that you don't have to think about to do, like digesting your lunch. It's happening right now, but you didn't have to decide to do it. It happens automatically. Um, things like uh, uh, sweating and so on, heartbeat. You don't have to tell your heart to beat, it'll just keep beating, even while you're asleep, hopefully. Blood pressure and things like that, all controlled by your autonomic nervous system. But when we're stressed, one half of your autonomic nervous system springs into action. It's called the sympathetic branch of your nervous system. It's a strange name for it because it's actually not very sympathetic. It causes us a lot of pain, but that's what it's called. And that's where the fight and flight response is housed. What does it do when it kicks in? It does things like it increases the, the, uh, the strength of your skeletal muscles because you're in danger, you need to have that, that strength. It decreases blood clotting time. So if you're stabbed or injured or a lion has attacked you, this part of your body, in a wonderful way, decreases your blood clotting time. It increases your heart rate. That's why you, when you feel stressed, your heartbeat goes up, your heart rate goes up. It increases your sugar and fat levels. It inhibits things like your digestion. You don't need to digest your food if a lion's going to eat you. Uh, you need to get rid of that lion. So it inhibits that. It reduces, uh, inhibits tears. It inhibits, uh, it relaxes your bladder. That's why some people wet themselves when they get a terrible fright. Because your, your sympathetic nervous system has, has kicked in. It dilates your pupils, it increases perspiration, mental activity. And it constricts most of the blood vessels. But the ones to your heart and your arms and your leg muscles are all dilated. Because you need those if you have to run away or attack someone. Well, that's incredible. That's your sympathetic nervous system. But the other half is the parasympathetic nervous system. And that has the opposite effect on our bodies. It's that part of your body, part of your brain, sorry, that enables you to relax. It enables your, your body to secrete cortisol, which gives you a sense of peace, a sense of calm, and a sense of well-being. Whereas adrenaline, which is secreted by the sympathetic nervous system, is the thing that makes you feel stressed. Now, well, that's just a little slide to show you what happens. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system on that side, you'll see uh, it, it regulates your breathing, helps you to notice your breathing and be aware of it, relaxation and so on. Well, this little slide brings me to the title of my uh, lecture this afternoon. You'll see quite simply there that in the, in, in the work of the amygdala, there's a stimulus the stimulus is sent, a message is sent to your amygdala, uh, and then the, the amygdala initiates a response by sending another message that, for your body to respond. Animals also have an amygdala. They have a very similar brain to ours, apart from the prefrontal cortex or the neocortex, which isn't developed very well in animals. But they all have an amygdala just like ours. And my dog, when the doorbell rings, like both my dogs, uh, the doorbell is a stimulus that sends a message to my dog's amygdala and the dog starts to bark and go crazy and rushes for the door, bashing up against the door, because uh, we've got an interleading door and then the front door, just because of that stimulus. Now, that's because the dog has an amygdala. Very important for animals to have an amygdala, amygdala for the same reason as it's important for us. But my dog, when, he, when she looks at me, thinks of me as another animal, I think. We're not so sure, but that, that seems obvious. 
And when my dog sees me stressed for days and days at a time, sometimes in the term time, in term time, I don't got massively stressed, but just busy, uh, you know, and, and coming home feeling tired or feeling I've got to do this first, I've got to do that before tomorrow, I've got to organize that sermon, organize that service, somebody's rung up who's ill in the hospital, go and see them. The dog perceives that I am angry, the dog perceives that, that just like another dog, I'm being aggressive. My dog wants me to be the kind of person that she thinks I am. In other words, my dog wants me to be like she is. Now this is what happens to my dog when the doorbell rings. I've just described the first part of it. There's a stimulus, a message is sent to the amygdala, and there's a response. The dog goes to attack whoever's there. But within about two minutes, after I've answered the door, taken the package from the courier, or whatever it is, and closed the door again, within about two minutes, my dog is fast asleep. The amygdala has been switched off, autom or, or, almost automatically, and my dog is fast asleep. Now, why is that? The reason is because the dog doesn't have a prefrontal cortex. My dog doesn't think about thoughts. My dog just gets a stimulus and responds to it. And then when the stimulus is gone, my dog falls asleep, just like Lottie is there in the movie. Are you all right? You're just resting your eyes. Okay. Uh, so that's why I say my dog expects me to be like that as well, to come back after a very stressful day and just switch off my amygdala. But I can't do it easily. And I suspect you can't do it either. If you're under stress in exam time or because of a relationship, because of something at home, whatever it may be, you and I find ourselves under, uh, uh, under stress with, 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 with adrenaline flooding our systems, sometimes for days and days, maybe even weeks and months. And imagine what that does to your system. Parts of your body stop working for you because your amygdala saying, danger, 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 exam, 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 uh, pressure, pressure, pressure. Your body's not functioning properly, you're not sleeping well because your amygdala's fired up like a Christmas tree. How on earth can we be more like my dog and just be switch off when we don't need it? And the answer is coming up in another, oh, there's a picture. Autopilot. Here's the first problem. We need to admit that multitasking, well, first of all, there's no such thing as multitasking. Uh, you just do things, your brain just flicks between things very quickly. You, you can't do two things at once. But multitasking, while it can be useful at times, is not something we should be too proud of, proud of because it does lead to problems. <laughs> because we don't notice what's happening around us in the real world in which we live, the real life we have to live. We are only alive in this moment, now. Yesterday has gone, lunchtime has gone, and never come back again. And tomorrow hasn't happened yet. We are only alive now. What a terrible thing if we miss it. If we're not even here while it's happening. Because our thought world has taken us somewhere else. And those years ago, I resolved that I want to be more in the now. I want to be there while my life is passing by, moment by moment. I'll tell you, when I take a shower now in the morning before I come to school, I really notice what's happening when the water uh, touches my body. But for years, I took showers without even noticing it. I was, my thought world was taking me all, all over the place. What am I going to do next? What meetings have I got today? What I do when I have a shower now, you try it. It'll be an amazing experience. You'll think, I can't believe that taking a shower can be such a pleasant experience. That warm water, wonderful. I didn't notice it for years. It's a tragedy because you're only alive in this moment now. Why do we get stuck in distress? Whether it is my distress that I explained to you earlier or yours, 
And each one of you will have suffering in your lives. I'm sorry to tell you that, but you will. Life is about suffering. Love is about suffering. If you love, it will be painful. I've discovered that in my, in my life. It doesn't mean that love is a bad thing. It just means that if you love enough, it will be painful at some, at some point in your experience. This stress is not such a bad thing, but why do we get stuck? Some of the reasons here. We suppress our feelings and thoughts. Let me get push it down. I won't think about it anymore. Just don't think about it, and it'll go away. Not always a good idea. Fight, struggle, avoid, run away. Adding extra problems, ruminating. What does rumination mean? It means thinking about the thoughts and thinking over and over again and overthinking things until eventually they become much more than they were in the first place. I think Mr. Wood will say something more about that in a moment. Blocking out, keeping busy, analyzing, trying to keep, uh, trying to think your way out of something. I had a man come to see me a few months ago because I'm a mindfulness therapist and sometimes people are referred and come to see me. And this man was coming for a few weeks and one day he came to, to, the, to the meeting and I could see he was upset and distressed and I said, what's the matter? He said, well, uh, um, I, I was in town, Taunton town this morning, uh, near uh, McDonald's there, and a man I've known all my life was coming towards me and he walked right past me and he didn't say good morning. I said good morning to him, he just ignored me. He said he hates me. I'm sure he hates me. I said, but why do you think that? He's, he's been, you went to school with him, you've been friends for all your, life, all your lives. He said, no, well, he's, he, he hates me. And I'm so angry with him because I said good morning to him. He just ignored me, just blanked me and, and walked on. I said, well, we were going to talk about other things today, but I can see this has upset you. Let's try to talk about it a bit more. Got a piece of paper out. I said, let's try to think about why he might have blanked you. No, 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 he said, I know why he hates me. He just hates me. That's it. I said, okay, we'll write that one down. One, he hates me. I said, well, do you think of any other reasons why he might have blanked you? No, no, no. And of course I could see his thoughts just going round and round and round. It's terrible when you say hello to someone in the corridor here at school even, and they just, just blank you, walk past you. Uh, you think, what have I done? What, what have I done to cause this? What's wrong with me? Um, and so on. All the thoughts start to go out of control. We came up, with, came up with another option, which I suggested to him. I said, does he wear glasses? Perhaps he wasn't wearing his glasses, and he just didn't see you. Well, he said, yeah, he does wear glasses, but he, still, he just hates me. But anyway, we wrote it down. He didn't have his glasses. And then I said, uh, what about the traffic? It's quite a lot of buses in that street near uh, McDonald's there. Perhaps there was a bus going past, and when you said, hello, all he heard was, oh, the bus went past. Uh, he said, uh, yeah, it was quite a bit of traffic. He okay, so wrote, wrote, wrote that one down. And eventually we had about 10 possible reasons why this man might have not said good morning to him. The next week he came back to see me again. And he said, oh, by the way, before we start, I know why that chap didn't say good morning to me. And, he gave, and he'd found out the reason. And he was so relieved. And I said, well, what, that, what we did in that exercise last week, is something that Buddhists have been doing for 4,000 years. They have a, a story called the 10,000 Things. And in that story, they teach young Buddhists as they're growing up that when something happens to you, don't automatically assume the worst. There may be 10,000 reasons why it has happened, and it may not be as bad as you think it is after all. So, some of the research, uh, I, I don't want to read that up to you, but you can just look at that for yourself. Uh, this is just in terms of reducing worry, doing well in your academic work, and so on. And there's just one more. You will have heard how top sports teams are using mindfulness to help the team members to focus, to help teams to gel. Uh, because what it does is it brings your five senses into play, cuts out all the overthinking and the worries about 
we've got to win this match, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, and just focus on what's really important. Become a human being rather than a human doing. I'm coming to the end of my, of my talk, but let me just say something about exam time and how we revise for things. Because this has helped me as well. I have to revise every week for the Eucharist. I've got a sermon to prepare and I've got to deliver it. So I've got to practice it. Um, and and there, there, there's a way of doing it which is much more effective than the way I think we're taught, perhaps at school. When you come to exam time, you often have perhaps your teacher saying to you, get to grips with it. Grab your textbook. Get to grips with it. Nail it. You know, we have expressions like that. Nail it. You've got to nail it. But what happens when you do that? in your mind is that you're switching on the amygdala straight away because it's a violent sort of thing. Get your grips with it, nail it, you've got to, you've got to succeed, you've got to beat this, you've got to beat that. Your amygdala switches on, fires like, up like a Christmas tree, shuts off all the parts of your brain that have to do with creative thinking, logical thinking, all the things you need if you have to write an exam. They all shut down or partially shut down and you're in this state of stress trying to write an exam. I believe we shouldn't be doing that. And I've stopped saying things like that, even to myself. I've got to nail this. I've got to nail it. I've got this lecture. I lecture uh, Friday afternoon. I've got to nail it. Because if I do that, my amygdala uh, lights up and I don't function properly. I want to be calm and I want to be assertive. I want to be happy and friendly. I want to be able to smile and not look like this because my amygdala is making me aggressive. So I'm going to... Hand, it, hand over to Mr. Wood now, who's going to say a few words, about five minutes, about pain. Okay, thank you. I'll be right at the end now, then perhaps there'll be some questions. James Joyce wrote a book called The Dubliner, uh, and in that book there's a lovely phrase which I mentioned uh, at lunch the other day, I think. Um, and this is the phrase, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And I love that because that's really what a lot of us do and what I, what I do, uh, or what I'm trying not to do. But, but we, we, we tend to live in our heads, we live in our thoughts, uh, instead of really living the life that we have moment by moment. So how do you rewire your brain, if that's what you want to do? How do you become a more calm, assertive person who does well in the challenges of life rather than attacking them uh, with aggression and, and not doing very well? Well, meditation is the most important way. And the reason for that is, just like my dog, you learn how to switch off your amygdala and metabolize the adrenaline that has flooded your body, let's say, for the whole day and your lessons and your activities and so on. Now you come to the point where you want to do your prep, where you want to relax, whatever it may be, and you find you can't because you're stressed by thoughts that are going around your head. How do you switch off your amygdala? Meditation. There are two ways you can, you can do it. Formal meditation and informal. The formal one, so what Mr. Woods just mentioned as well, where you need to spend at least 20 minutes somewhere where it's reasonably quiet, it doesn't have to be dead quiet, but reasonably quiet, where no one will disturb you, um, and just practice this sense of mindfulness. Using your breath, which are, by the way is the only thing that's with you from the moment you're born <coughs> until the moment of your death. Your breath. It's always there, so useful. Use it as an anchor for thoughts. If you think of your thoughts like balloons, in the, in the sky, going here and there, uh, out of control. Use your breath as an anchor, just like we've practiced now. And if you can do that for 20 minutes, how long does it take to metabolize adrenaline? 20 minutes, more or less. So if you're flooded with adrenaline, you, when I was a policeman, there was a car crash. Uh, it was a, one of these VW uh, uh, cars. And um, when I got there and ran towards the accident, car was on its, on, its, uh, on its route. The lady who'd been driving the car, the young mother, she was about that high, tiny. And as I ran up to her, she didn't see me coming. She had her back to me because her baby was trapped underneath the car. 
and she flipped that car over single-handedly. I'll never forget. You know, it was only a small car, but I mean, she, she just went like that, and, and the, the car just rolled over onto its, onto its wheel. It was a rush of adrenaline because her baby was trapped. And her amygdala switched on, the adrenaline kicked in, and she was able to do that for a few seconds. And the baby was, was actually okay in the end. But I think it probably took her weeks to switch off her amygdala, whereas my dog can do that in a few minutes. So meditation, try, try it, just try it and see what it does for you. And then the last thing is the short practices. Those are things you can do during the day while you're walking from your house to a lesson if you're on your own. Uh, you can just notice what's happening in your five senses. What can I see? What do I hear? Can I smell? Can uh, I taste the toothpaste? I just brushed my teeth. Yeah. Just notice and then move on. And that'll, that'll make a world of difference. It has for me. And those are the short informal practices. Any questions? That's a Jack Russell called Jack. <laughs> Any questions for me or Mr. Wood? Yes, is that Dan? Name, That's Jack. And Ella is our um, Springer Spaniel. Yep. When you find yourself in pain in any circumstance, will you always go to mindfulness or has there ever been a point in this past eight years where you haven't? You mean physical pain? Well, well yeah. or emotional pain. Well, well in these last years, um, I, I definitely do go to mindfulness. And I, and I, I say to myself, yeah, there's certain things, sort of a checklist that I go through. And if it's emotional pain, like something that I'm worried about, my mother was in hospital a couple of months ago, she's fine now, but we were worried about her. She's 80, and uh, we thought, you know, she wasn't going to make it. And I'm here in England, she's in South Africa, do I fly over? I said, said to Mr. Biggs, I might have to go to South Africa. He said, yes, fine, if you need to go. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, worry, stress. What if, this, what, if the, what if she dies and I haven't managed to get there? Or I haven't taken the trouble to book a flight? And she dies and I don't get a chance to say goodbye to her. Things like that. What if, what if, what if? These are thoughts that go round and round, cause pain. But then I do go back to the mindfulness and I say, well, it may not happen. It probably won't happen. She's in good hands. She's in a very good hospital. Um, my brothers have advised me that it's not necessary to fly over. And so I'm not going to allow thoughts to cause me pain. So yes, I, I the answer is here. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Does mindfulness work for everyone? Very good question. I don't think it does. And the people like John Kabat-Zinn, who started making mindfulness popular again, says that himself. He's always asked that question. Some people say, "I just that doesn't do it for me. It's just not. For, it's not for me." And he says, "Well, that that may well be the case. It it, it probably doesn't work for everybody." It's just w a, one way to switch off your amygdala, to take control of your fight and flight response center. But you may find another way to do it. It may be cycling or going to the gym or something like that. Thank you. Yes, Lorca? Very good question. Uh, NICE, the uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which is a government, uh, it's a government structure, they have recommended mindfulness to the NHS. And you can get free mindfulness uh, therapy. The problem is it takes about six or six to eight months, depending on where you are in the country, just to get a first appointment. They don't have enough therapists um, working for the NHS. Yes, addictions, uh, it's very helpful for most addictions. The problem does come when, for example, asthmatics, for example, we, you know, I would never use mindfulness with an asthmatic because you're focusing on the breathing. And of course, breath is the problem for asthmatics. People who have um, very severe long-term addictions may also find it distressing because you're spending half an hour a day just uh, trying to um, focus on your breathing and on your body um, and so on. And so it can be difficult. But for, I think for most addiction, because what is an addiction? It's a neural pathway that has been laid down over months and years and years. 
And the, the way to undo a neural pathway and establish a new one is by repetition uh, of, of something different and then let the old one grass over. So it, it is very helpful for addiction. Any more questions? Thank you. Um, thank you yeah. very much. On behalf of everyone, I'd like to say a thank you to Father Mark and to Mr Wood for uh, an interesting speech. And I don't think many people knew not much about mindfulness and the uh, positive effects. And I particularly enjoyed learning about the, um, the brain and how it reacts to various problems. Um, and I'm sure many people use mindfulness in the future, especially the exams coming up. So um, yeah, if you all join me in a round of applause. For